Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, before we get started, there will be a Q&A. We'll try to make time for a brief Q&A at the end. So if you've got any questions <coughs> that arise uh, during the panel, please submit them via the QR code, which you should see on the screen just up there. Um, so we've just been hearing about the financial implications of climate change, and we're going to turn now to a slightly different but deeply interconnected problem of nature loss. We're seeing a record loss of biodiversity in almost every single country in the world, and climate change is both a driver of and driven by that loss. This time last year, over 190 countries signed a pact that's been dubbed the Paris Agreement for Nature, and that pinpointed a funding gap of over $700 billion per year by 20, 2030. But those flows have failed to materialize. I am joined today by three individuals who are doing something fairly rare and tangible in this space. They are investing in, so they are making returns from nature restoration. We've got Peter, who's an investor, uh, Ramsey, who's an investment banker, and Alexandra in the middle, who's written a PhD on how to finance nature protection and has since set up a company doing just that. Um, Alexandra and Peter are in the business of biodiversity credits, and I expect you're all familiar with carbon credits, but biodiversity credits are something a little bit different. These are tradable units of biodiversity uplift. So, for example, you buy a piece of land, you change the way in which it's managed, and you measure the difference from A to B against a predefined metric. And it's that that then gets packaged, that number that is thrown up there that gets packaged into a biodiversity credit. And that can be sold to companies who either want to make a positive contribution to nature or to offset their, their, their harm to nature. And that's a kind of somewhat controversial distinction. There's a debate going around that in the space, which we'll turn to. Um, but first, Alexandra, please could you tell us a bit about what you're doing and how you're creating biodiversity credits? Um, thank you, and thank you for inviting me to participate today. Um, I just have to make a small correction. I have not yet written a PhD. Okay. <laughs> I'm still working on it. <laughs> but um, um, I'm a CEO of Colbo Natural Asset Company, and we are uh, owned by uh, Mr. Connie Johnson and his fam uh, family. Uh, Mr. Connie Johnson is the uh, founder of EQT. Some people may know of him. Um, and uh, our job is to make returns, attractive returns, from uh, nature-positive forestry, which we do in order to create um, positive biodiversity outcome alongside sustainable wood production. So that is what we do. And um, the, I got into this through my research uh, and my previous experience in uh, forestry investments. So we are applying the methods that we developed through the research uh, on various geographies and ecosystems. Okay, and, and Peter, you're investing um, in a type of project developer or a market intermediary in the compliance of the regulated market in England, um, which will enter into force into January. What has made that an investable proposition for you there? Yeah, well, firstly, can I just say what a great warm up act for nature. John <laughs> yeah. Kerry and uh, Ray Dalio, I think that's amazing. But I mean, before I start, like for me, the why is also what nature can do. Like if we do nature-based solutions on a global basis, we could get 10 gigatons worth of CO2 savings. You know, this COP has been about renewables. That's equivalent to 44,000 gigawatts worth of renewables, or the emissions of the US, the EU, and Japan combined. So that's why we care about biodiversity and the power it can actually have to help us reach net zero. In terms of how we've invested in it, we've got two strands. So one is, as um, Natasha talked about, the compliance market. So in the UK, for all of its faults, it's created what we think is a landmark piece of legislation called the Environment Act, which for the first time has put an economic value on nature. You know, this is incredible, because what you need to do now, if you're in the UK, you want to get planning permission, so permission to build something significant, you need to improve the biodiversity by at least 10%. That might not sound very hard, but if you've got a greenfield site and you want to turn it into an Amazon warehouse full of concrete, that's tough. So what we've done is created an off-site mechanism where we're taking non-productive land, so this is not food-grade land, this is stuff that you can't really do much with, and we turn it into these woodlands, wetlands, species-rich mosaics of biodiversity that create a huge amount of impact for the planet. And what we can do, therefore, is create a value whereby these developers can either do it on-site, which means they need to give up developable land, or they do it off-site with what we're doing within the local planning area, and we're able to sell that to those developers, and we create a financial return, which we think is quite attractive. 
And we've structured a mechanism whereby we're investing our funds, and we've now created a dedicated vehicle to invest solely into this biodiversity strategy. And we've got investors like WTW, or Willis House Watson in there as well, investing in this today. So this is an investable proposition that we're doing something with today. The other strand that we follow is what we call the voluntary market. So actually, we think there's a lot of corporates that want to become nature positive. There's a lot of companies in the UK, for example, that have said they want to become nature positive soon. And what we've created is a, a mechanism whereby we've created these huge projects. So we've got our first landmark project in the north of Norfolk called the Wolferton Project, where we're taking land to effectively connect up the Norfolk coast with a series of wetland mosaics to farmland that would otherwise not be very productive. So this is a mechanism where we're creating a huge amount of improvements to the soil quality, flood defense, but importantly, biodiversity uplifts that we can measure. So we do a baseline survey, and we expect to see about 20, 20 times, 20x increase in species diversity. And we also expect to see a 5x improvement in, in important birds, as an example. So you know, we think we can create a nature-positive mechanism. It's all measured and monitored. And we can sell that to corporates who want to become nature-positive. And that's something we've invested in today as well. And just to kind of put a number on, on, on the value of these credits, when in the voluntary carbon market, we're talking about kind of, I think the average is around $10 per credit. In the biodiversity, the compliance market in, in England, Peter was just telling me that these are going for anything from $30,000 a credit to $2 million a credit. And that kind of ranges from uh, grassland to kind of complex wetlands that you're restoring. So the, the multiples are, are huge there. Um, and Peter and Alexandra, you've, just, you've both just mentioned nature positive. Could you perhaps explain, um, Alexandra, maybe in your role at the Biodiversity Credits Alliance, which is a standards body around this market, what nature positive means and how that's distinct from um, the kind of net concept that we're familiar with in the climate world? Yeah, that's a great question and a very important one. Um, the, the way we think about it is um, that you need to do whatever you can to minimize the negative impacts of your operations first and foremost before you can think of buying into biodiversity credits for example um, so getting net uh, kind of zero negative impact is the step one companies should take including ourselves when we do forestry operations uh, but to create the positive uplift can be only done when you've kind of sweeped in front of your own door so there's a role for both offsets to get to the net, the net level and then credits to, come, to become a, po a positive? Um, well, um, I'm not sure um, offsets. I, I, I'm not working with offsets. Um, I think both offsets and voluntary biodiversity credits do have a place. Uh, but I think before, all, you know, you can use offsets to get to the net zero and then possibly biodiversity credits to get to the net positive level. But first of all, to minimize the negative impacts. Okay. Yeah. Can I just go one step further? So um, we've done a huge amount to destroy our biodiversity. So in the UK, for example, we're in the bottom 10% globally in terms of biodiversity intactness. And if we just look at protect, that's not going to get us above to where we need to. You know, we need to be doing enhance and restore to really try to get back the planet to where it needs to be. So Nature Positive is doing a really, really large positive step to try to replace and improve what has been taken away. So it's, it's, it's a lot more than just a, a, an offset type mechanism. OK. I think we'll, yeah, we'll, we can come back to that. But I want to come now to Ramsey, who's doing something a bit different. Um, Ramsey has played a pioneering role in structuring debt for nature swaps. So these are deals that have been around since the 80s. But Ramsey has structured them at, originally at Credit Suisse, and he's now at UBS, in a way that's, for, that, that's made them attracted to institutional investors, so pension funds that wouldn't normally invest in places or projects that we're talking about here through a kind of blended finance approach, which has been hot on everyone's lips this week at COP28. Um, so Ramsey, could you tell us a bit about how you did that, perhaps the blended aspect? Uh, yeah, so th first of all, thank you for, <coughs> for having me uh, here. Uh, so just maybe a little bit of background for those that are unfamiliar with uh, how the transactions work. So high level uh, debt swaps is a financing mechanism to fund SDGs. That's kind of the the first the sustainable step. Development goals. Sustainable development goals, thank you. Um, and the, the twist that we do here is that that funding for, development, uh, for developing uh, economies is done through debt savings rather than additional or new debt. Um, so in the 
it, at CS, we, we did the, the first three transactions in the market, and then for, 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 for context for people in, in the room. Uh, so we, uh, we executed transactions for the first one in Belize, Barbados, and most recently in Ecuador. Uh, we refinanced about 2.3 billion of their debt that generate about uh, $700 million for co uh, ocean conservation and um, $1.2 billion of additional uh, debt savings on top of that. Uh, so, uh, so one of the things that we, you know, for, for these transactions to work, they have kind of two key, um, uh, I'd say, uh, parties involved, a part obviously from the investors. Uh, so the first is uh, we work very closely with, the, uh, with NGOs, uh, particularly these transactions, we worked with the Nature Conservancy and the Pew Bertarelli uh, Ocean Legacy. Um, so that's kind of a very key, uh, key uh, part of the transaction for institutional investors because they want to have you know, uh, credible and high quality implementing partners um, uh, to, you know, to not only uh, select the projects based on you know, uh, sound scientific uh, uh, reasons, but also to, uh, to ensure that the funding gets deployed and also is monitored. Uh, so that's the, the kind of the first uh, key, uh, key condition. And then the kind of the second key condition is the work with development finance institutions. Uh, so in the, in the transactions that we've executed so far, uh, we've worked with the DFC and the IADB. Um, and these, the, let's say that the, financial, the financing mechanism relies on the, the debt savings, as I mentioned earlier, which uh, is realized through the credit enhancement that these institutions play. Um, but that's not the only role that they play in the transactions which are relevant to, to the institutional investors because you can get some of that uh, credit enhancement through the private markets. But the other kind of key role um, that they have in the transaction is more of a stabilizing role, um, which then allows us to not only get the credit enhancement, but also to be able to term out the debt for developing countries, which is important from like a policy point of view. So effectively, what the, the countries are able to do is to, to lock in cheaper debt um, and repay it over a longer term period, uh, which you know, all else equal should mean that uh, they all, their economies should be a bit more resilient to global economic shocks like the uh, pandemic, for example, three years ago. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, as you can hear, they're quite complex transactions. They're buying co these countries are being helped to buy back debt from the bond markets. They then reissue new debt, which is cheaper with a longer maturity, and the savings from that are freed up for nature conservation projects. Right. And when you listen to Peter and Alexandra talk about their work on biodiversity credits, how do you? What's going through your mind there? How do you see opportunities, and what's the linkages between what Alexandra and Peter are doing and, and what you're doing with your work? Yeah, so, um, so again, from a, a 10,000 foot view, uh, these transactions ultimately in the first step are, are meant to finance, hard to finance projects, right? So, uh, and from a financial point of view, that those are projects that don't necessarily in the first order generate revenues to cover the cost of debt. And that's why we're, we're relying on, on reduction of debt to free up budget capacity to be able to redeploy that into the, into the marine conservation and the deals that we've done. But I think you know, some of the work that's being done on the biodiversity credit, uh, for me, you know, when we talk to some of the sovereigns, we say you know, nature protection is not just a, is not a, a first step, um, and it's not mutually exclusive uh, from not generating new, new revenues, right? So I think some of the work that, that Alexandra is doing uh, is you know, the, kind of the step to kind of continue, or, or the, the bridge that can continue to say, well, the first, you've, you've successfully um, uh, protected uh, nature, you've created some uh, sustainable financing mechanism to do that, and now there is a, a revenue, potential revenue source from doing that, that activity. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, and I want to turn now to kind of this, 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 this skepticism that has um, surfaced in relation to the biodiversity credits or offsets market. So obviously the carbon market <coughs> has had a troubling couple of years um, around carbon accounting, but also getting money to people on the ground who's really doing the, the difference there. Um, could you talk, Alexandra, a bit about the work that you're doing to um, address those problems with biodiversity credits, including how you can make nature fungible? So obviously swapping a giraffe in Kenya for a 
forest in mm. Sweden or the UK is, is, a, is, a, is a challenging task, to say the least. What are you doing to put the standards in place in the market so, mm. to address those issues? Well, I can speak of the experience that we've been involved um, in the transaction uh, between a private forest owner, a, a big forest area in Sweden, and uh, Swedbank, uh, one of the major banks in Sweden. Uh, this was part of the research project to begin with, and uh, we wanted to test uh, whether the, the crediting methodology we developed um, actually works in practice and if there is any market uh, interest in it. Turns out there is market interest in this. Um, but of course, a lot of questions about how does it work? Uh, how can we follow it up? Um, um, and there are a lot of things that are not in place yet. Like there is no global standard for uh, biodiversity credits. There are uh, a lot of emerging methodologies, et cetera, et cetera. But the way we address this is that we have involved Swedbank in this case from the beginning to the end throughout the project um, and we're totally transparent with um, the, the financial side of it, the, the, the costs of the project, etc. So they were involved all the time. Um, and the forest owner luckily was um, you know, willing to, to put forward some of the land that they're managing uh, into this project. And basically, what well, the, the long story short, we could prove that the, 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 for, the, the me crediting methodology does work, in this case, in production forest landscapes, which, by the way, is a huge opportunity to scale uh, and um, to, to provide um, you know, less risky investment, so to speak, into biodiversity. Um, 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 and that I think that um, investors might like it. It's, it's uh, biodiversity uplift um, at, uh, at lower risk. Yeah, and Peter, can I get your response as well to that, including the, this point <coughs> around um, whether it's productive land or un, uh, unproductive land, which is something that you alluded to at the beginning? Yeah, so look, I, I guess just in terms of the biodiversity carbon credit thing, I think carbon has gone to a race to the bottom in terms of integrity. And I think where the voluntary biodiversity market needs to be is a race to the top in terms of real ecological integrity. So I think that's the bedrock. And I think you know, biodiversity is not fungible like carbon. So you know, first and foremost, it's proximate to where it needs to be. It needs to be replacing the type of biodiversity that's been taken away in the first place. But you know, we've got this business, the Environment Bank, and we've got 70 of the best ecologists and land management specialists in the world. And they actually tell me, Governance and fully funded, funded, or like being fully funded, is almost as important as the ecology aspect as well. So where we see this market going is really, we're not sure what standard is going to apply to it, but you need to have absolute ecological integrity. You need to ensure that it's funded so you actually get to the end result, because a lot of projects in the carbon market never got to the, the finish line. And then ultimately, they need to be governed in a way that you can be sure that they're going to be operated in the right way. You have the right mechanisms to step in if people aren't doing the right things along the way. So I think this is an evolving space. Uh, I think you know, this is a great chance for corporates that want to do this to be bold and, and to become, you know, we're trying to create nature shares where it's actually not a credit, it's actually you're being part, you've got an asset that's increasing in value every year in terms of defined biodiversity outcomes. So you know, there's some of the things that we're thinking about in terms of trying to create the integrity that we need for this market to scale properly. Okay, we've got just under five minutes left. I wanted to see if there's any questions from the audience. Can you guys hear me? Okay. All right. Um, I'm just going to go through these, see what, see what we've got. Biodiversity is site-specific. One cannot use a credit from anywhere given site-specific rare flora. How can biodiversity credits overcome this challenge? Ooh, that's a tricky one. <laughs> I can um, uh, answer to that. Uh, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, I think, you know, actually doing research in this space, I can say that you do need a PhD to understand biodiversity assessments. <laughs> you know, it, it, is, it is very, very complicated. And it's, it's true, you know, biodiversity looks different from place to place. Uh, but we can agree on certain frameworks that can be applied anywhere in the world. And therefore, I think there is an opportunity to create a, um, a global standard if we want to. But then we need to have local applications. Uh, 
And um, I think there is a lot of discussion today about different types of uh, remote sensing and opportunities in uh, you know, measuring biodiversity by satellites. And I think definitely that's the future. However, at this point in time, it does not provide enough granularity uh, on the ground. So you need to combine you know, people inventoring, doing the inventory on foot uh, with the satellite data to get uh, proper data. Yeah, I'd just say in the UK government, they've got this thing called the DEFRA metric. So the government department that manages the, the rural economy does try to put a relative value on biodiversity and it is trying to get over some of those challenges. And so there is a scientific way to sort of bridge the gap a little bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's not perfect. You still can't take a woodland and turn it into grassland and expect that they're going to be like for like. It is quite specific and it's, it's regionally important as well. Great. Um, I will add the commentary from this one so that you get the compliment. Could I ask our excellent panelists about <laughs> velocity? As positive as debt for nature swaps are, it appears to take a long time for those dollars to be put to work for shovel-ready projects. Why are these debt solutions not more rolled into larger blended structures to bring in additional private investors? Okay, so thank you. So I'll, I'll, I can take that one. Um, so I, th I think the... Uh, when people kind of see the end product, it seems like that it's a it's a fairly kind of straightforward um, exercise. But uh, what happens actually leading up to that is that there's a lot of research uh, that goes into an engagement in the local community to identify what is exactly um, kind of key projects to uh, to focus on. Uh, so I think um, you know to simply answer that is that I think there is a lot of like scientific work that's being done to kind of prep, prep, prepare uh, and give like the rationale of, of why they need funding to begin with. So it's not just about announcing some, some you know, lofty goals. It's saying, you know, if we target these type of KPIs or these types of projects, uh, all else equal, we, we should expect that the project should have the impact that all the parties are working hard towards to, to, to obtain. Right. But there was an announcement yesterday, wasn't there, from multilateral development banks that yeah. you see as potentially um, helping to scale this, these deals? Yeah, uh, yeah, so I think helping to, to definitely to scale because now uh, there are about eight uh, development finance institutions now that uh, have, are, have signed together uh, a joint statement, uh, six of which are new. So I think it helps um, uh, to some extent obviously bring in some more capital because you have more credit enhancement providers in the development finance world. But also, I think it's some form of validation, I think, for the transactions themselves, that they see that they actually have incremental impact. And, you know, we, you know to have a bit of patience that these deals, uh, you know, it's, it's not in financial markets timeline. These are kind of real world uh, projects. But I think, uh, you know, now we have six new uh, DFIs who have raised their hands to say, you know, we want to participate in this market because we think it, it actually leads to uh, to, to real impact. So, so I think it's also a validation of the financing structure uh, you know, that we helped uh, set up. Yeah, absolutely. And on that note, I think we're just about at time. So I want to thank my wonderful panelists today. Um, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.